The Rational Apprentice podcast is linear rather than topical. This means that the podcast should be listened to in order. This also means that skipping episodes will prevent you from fully understanding the concepts being presented and may cause you to miss or misconstrue vital proofs. That being said, welcome to the Rational Apprentice podcast. In the past few episodes, I've given you Professor Galambos' definitions of the term theft and slavery. And we talked about whether A, taking C's car, either by himself or by hiring or voting for someone to do it for him, fit the definitions and thus constituted theft, constituted slavery. Finally, we added to that the variable of A's getting the approval of the entire community to take C's car, and whether that rules out the crime of theft. And that's kind of a fun thing to do. But at no stage, and I've stated this a number of times by now, at no stage did I assign a value judgment to theft or slavery. I never said whether I thought that theft was right or wrong, or whether slavery was right or wrong. And I've never asked you to do so either. What I did do is familiarize you with what I call the Snelson triads, and to consider which of the three possible outcomes was correct for the concepts of theft and slavery. One, theft is always right. Two, theft is always wrong. And three, theft is sometimes right and sometimes wrong. And of course, ditto for slavery. Slavery is always right. Slavery is always wrong. Or slavery is sometimes right and sometimes wrong. But now I have to admit, when I've talked to people about this in the past, regardless of the size of the group, the vast majority of people agree that theft was always wrong and that slavery was always wrong. And the vast majority of people also agree that for all the scenarios, A, taking C's car without his permission, constituted theft and constituted slavery. And so without, of course, getting your direct opinion on the matter, as this is a podcast and not a live lecture, I can surmise that for the A, B, C scenarios that I proposed, most of you would probably also agree that theft is always wrong and slavery is always wrong. But the A, B, C scenarios are simple and two-dimensional. They're black and white. They're nuance and emotion-free scenarios. What happens when we make them more realistic? If you are currently of the opinion that theft is always wrong and that slavery is always wrong, let's see if your opinion changes or falters. One, Joy goes for her annual physical exam. Her doctor is one of 300 medical practitioners in a massive medical complex. While sitting in the examination room waiting, Joy, without her doctor's permission, grabs three or four pairs of surgical gloves for personal use at home. Is this theft? Is it slavery? Number two, a father with tears in his eyes takes $10,000 from you without your permission to pay for a surgical procedure that will restore the legs of his daughter who has been a paraplegic ever since the accident when she was hit by a drunk driver. Is this theft? Is this slavery? Number three, an engineer working in her shop for 15 years innovates a new revolutionary method of energy generation that is highly efficient and completely environmentally friendly. In fact, the waste product from this energy conversion technique is a currently scarce and highly valuable material that can be immediately used in modern manufacturing. Her invention is stolen by someone who, without the engineer's permission, sells the design to a major energy firm, which takes the product into production. Now, even though the innovator receives no money for the generator, energy scarcity worldwide is virtually eliminated overnight, finally giving the third world the leg up it has always needed, increasing efficiencies everywhere, and eliminating most harmful energy-related waste. Is this theft? Is this slavery? Four, you, your small son, and your husband or wife have been living in a rundown apartment building. You've been saving for years to finally be able to move to the home of your dreams. You finally scrape together the down payment and can make enough to cover the mortgage payments. This is awesome. You are finally going to get out of here and move to a place more civilized, where your little boy can go to a good school and there aren't any crack dealers outside your front door. Then... Suddenly, the Federal Reserve increases the interest rates, making those monthly payments $800 more than you can afford. But 
your real estate agent informs you of something fantastic. With a federally backed FHA loan, you can get a reduced tax subsidized rate, lowering your personal interest rate back down to something you can afford. Is this theft? Is this slavery? And finally, five, you and your wife or husband go to Michelle's, a French restaurant much lauded for their fantastic wine list and elegant service. Upon entering, you quietly and untruthfully tell the hostess that it's your 10th wedding anniversary, which, upon completion of your meal, prompts the staff to sing a congratulatory melody at your table and present you both with a gratis creme caramel. Is this theft? Is this slavery? So what do you think? If theft is the seizure of property of another without their consent, and slavery is the control of another's property without their consent, and it's observable that it is not possible to seize another person's property without also controlling it, each and every one of these five scenarios must fit the definitions of both theft and thus slavery. There are only two possibilities when it comes to property leaving your control. It either leaves your control voluntarily or it leaves your control involuntarily. There are no other options. The question then arises, are there various and different rules for the seizure of property without the permission of the owner? Now, before we answer that, well, it's story time. I'm going to tell you a story now, which Professor Galambos aptly called the pig story. It's kind of set up like a priest and a rabbi walk into a bar kind of joke, but it's not a joke and there's no punchline. It's just a really highly useful metaphor. All right, so the story goes that there was a reporter doing an expose on farmers, ranchers, and their respective communities. And in order to get some firsthand opinions on the matter, he goes out to ranch country to speak to a few of the locals to get their take. So the reporter is driving along the back roads and he comes across a ranch, not a huge ranch by any means, but it seemed well kept and best of all, the rancher was already outside working. So the reporter stops his car, he gets out and with microphone and recorder in hand, he asks the rancher if he'd be willing to answer a few questions. Well, Hollyfield was the rancher's name, the Hollyfield Ranch, and he seemed a nice enough fellow. And he agreed to answer a few questions if they didn't take too long. Great, says the reporter. Let me give you a scenario. I see you have a neighbor just across the road there, and he has a ranch too. Yep, replied the rancher. That's a Jansen ranch. Good folks at Jansen's. Well, Mr. Hollyfield, asked the reporter, if, say, there were a drought, and Mr. Jansen had lost his cows to that drought, and you had two cows, would you give Mr. Jansen one of your cows to help the family out? Well, thought the rancher, Sure, I would reckon I'd help the Jansons out with a cow. Sure. Uh-huh, said the reporter, checking his notes. And Mr. Hollyfield, if, say, they had lost their horses as well to the drought, and you had two horses, would you help them out with a horse? Sure enough, replied Mr. Hollyfield. Like I says, the Jansons, they's good folks. The reporter checked his notes again, made a quick mark, and said, Okay, Mr. Hollyfield, now, if the Jansons had also lost their pigs to this drought, and you had two pigs. Would you help them out with a pig? Well, now, the rancher furrowed his brow and thought a minute before he looked over to the reporter and said, Nope. Now, quite taken aback, the reporter incredulously looked at the rancher and said, But, sir, I'm confused. You said previously that if the Jansons lost their cows and you had two cows, you'd give them a cow. Then you said that if the Jansons had lost their horses and you had two horses, you'd give them a horse. But now you're saying that if the Jansons lost their pigs, you wouldn't help them out with a pig. What's the difference? Well, simple, replied Mr. Holyfield as he walked away getting back to work. See, I'm a pig farmer. I got two pigs. Okay, so what's the takeaway here? Well, the pig is analogous to self-interest. If you have a strong personal preference or an axe to grind, that's your pig. The point is, is that it's not difficult for us to make or follow rules, philosophies, or commandments when those rules, philosophies, or commandments impose little or no impediment upon us when it's not our pig. It is, however, a very different thing when it is our pig, 
when we are the ones restricted or impacted. In our story, Mr. Holyfield was quite generous when it came to the charitable distribution of hypothetical cows and horses. But once the scenario involved his very real pigs, his magnanimity was overmatched by his self-interest. It's human nature. Not because that's the way I want it, it's just the way it is. But the same applies to theft and slavery. It's not difficult to call A a thief when he's stealing a hypothetical car from C. But when A and C become real people in real situations, it becomes more difficult for us to maintain our convictions. After all, a few rubber gloves from a multi-million dollar company or a single dessert from a big restaurant. I mean, really, who's it hurting? And after all, A takes C's car, but C's insured. They'll never even miss it. They won't even notice. And the invention of a new energy generation method with virtually no downsides, it's a benefit to everyone on the planet. Something as huge as that has to be developed and distributed to anyone who wants to use it as quickly as possible, right? But does the seizure of a few rubber gloves or the fraudulent manipulation of the restaurant staff without the consent of the owners fit our definition of theft and thus involuntary servitude or slavery? And does the seizure of a new energy conversion technique without the consent of the owner fit our definition of theft and thus involuntary servitude or slavery? An energy generation technique that is a direct derivative of the engineer's life and actions. And I might add, would not have even existed without that engineer. But could it be that because we're the ones benefiting here, because it's our pig, we now have a hard time maintaining our convictions, and thus we look to justify? So we end up back with my original query. Are there different rules for the seizure of property without the permission of the owner? Is context something to be considered when it comes to theft and slavery? Well, perhaps it is. Perhaps it does make a difference, and there is such a thing as good theft and good slavery. It may be that theft and slavery can be highly constructive practices that are and have historically been beneficial to mankind. And the entire problem of the past has been that we simply have not had enough theft and slavery. Well, it could be. As we discussed when forming our company, Subjugation Inc., the great problem we had was to figure out how to gain control of people's property without their permission. I mean, if we couldn't do that one simple thing, we'd never be able to enslave them. In contrast, if people ever figure out how to retain control over their own property, the derivatives of their lives, well, then they can completely prevent themselves from being enslaved. And that's not going to be good for business at Subjugation Inc. So in pondering the rightness or wrongness of theft and the rightness or wrongness of slavery, we have thus far determined that there's every possibility that theft and slavery are good and beneficial to mankind. And there is every possibility that theft and slavery are bad and detrimental to mankind. We've seen scenarios that using relative means could point to both, haven't we? But what if there were, as I mentioned in the last episode, what if there were a way to scientifically determine whether theft and slavery were right or wrong, objectively, in all cases? Now, this has historically been a seemingly impossible task, but Professor Galambos innovated the solution. It is something quite unique to the Galambian theory, the application of the scientific method outside of the realm of the natural sciences, specifically applied to society. In the coming episodes, I will explain to you what he figured out and demonstrate how to use the scientific method to determine the rightness or wrongness of human action as a total concept applied to everything not just physics. But that means first, we will have to discuss the obverse terms, relative versus absolute, right versus wrong, good versus bad, and of course, true versus false. 
And that's where we'll pick it up in the next episode. All right, everyone, that'll do it for today. Let me remind you that in order to get the weekly Mind Over Murder case notes, you'll need to sign up for the weekly Substack newsletter. In addition to the Mind Over Murder case notes, we'll have studies, practices, courses, and bonus materials coming out in the near future, and I know you're going to want to get a hold of those when they come out. So head on over to therationalapprentice.substack.com to sign up for free right now. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.